Good afternoon friends. Welcome to the STP training webinar which is Advanced Anomaly Detection in Canary Testing. Our speaker for the day is John Seaton. I'm Smita Mishra, a professional tester myself, and I'm excited to host you all and John on our STP webinars. Quick information for all of you. Uh, the next upcoming webinar uh, conference we have is Spring 2019 STP Con, which will be held at San Francisco from April 1st to 4th in 2019. The keynotes have been selected and announced, and we have Jason Arbon, a bright entrepreneur and a sharp professional who is the CEO of uh, Test.ai. You can look him up for uh, learning AI and testing, and maybe fundraising too, since he has raised a huge round for his startup. Next is uh, Mary Thorne. She's the president of uh, Mary Thorne Consulting and a hugely respected figure in agile and testing industry likewise. She's been uh, a leading coach in, the, in both the subjects. Our third and uh, most seasoned keynote is Michael Bolton. He's uh, a consulting software tester and testing teacher. He's perhaps one of the most known authority on testing today. If you plan to attend the upcoming conference, don't forget there are various discounts and offers for alumni attendees and team registrations. We just uh, have gone through with the Black Friday and Cyber Monday sale on tickets. Um, hope some of you actually benefited with that offer. If you do have queries, uh, please email them to info at softwaretestpro.com. Another quick piece of information we have for you here is that there is an upcoming webinar how measuring defect detection uh, percentage improves test coverage by Matt on 12th December. Matt is the solution uh, senior solution architect at TaskTop. The link is up for you to review and register, so please go for it. All right, and if you are on Twitter, please share the conference information and about this webinar with your followers and connections. You can also add STP's Twitter handle to your tweets, which is at Software Test Pro. Uh, to add the hashtag STP webinar, so we know it's for this one. So let's get started with the webinar today. A very warm welcome, John. We are very thrilled to have you with us today. Uh, let me quickly introduce you for all of us here. Uh, John Seaton is the Director of Data Science at Functionize. He's a 29-year-old data scientist who graduated with a triple major in maths and science. Fresh out of school, he was hand-selected by Apple, Pandora, and MIT, among others, to lead massive-scale, consumer-facing big data projects. John's background in machine learning and artificial intelligence spans a range of industries, from medical to finance, where he was tapped by Silicon Valley venture capitalists to develop proprietary, uh, proprietary algorithms for them that would help them identify profitable investment targets. So let me now transfer the control to you, uh, John. A very warm welcome again, and the floor is all yours now. Great, thanks. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, as I said, my name is John Seaton, uh, Director of Data Science at Functionize. Uh, and today I'm gonna be talking about um, advanced anomaly detection in canary testing, um, amongst a couple of other things. Um, so, um, uh, an outline, just a quick outline of uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about an overview of the company Functionize. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, may not have heard of Functionize before. Uh, we're a relatively young startup, uh, started about uh, three years ago, uh, but have been growing very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to give a little bit overview of the context where I come from at Functionize. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit more about machine learning. Uh, give everyone uh, sort of a basic overview of what machine learning is, you know, what we can do with machine learning, uh, different types of approaches. Uh, then we're going to dive into the canary testing. What is canary testing um, and how we can use it to, uh, for example, gate releases, find anomalies, that type of thing. And then how, you know, some of the techniques we use in doing anomaly detection. So just a brief uh, overview of the company, uh, Functionize. So, um, the company started a while ago. Um, the founder, uh, Tomas, uh, had a consulting practice, uh, which he was doing a lot of software development. And uh, he realized that uh, uh, software testing was a large pain point for him uh, in developing software. So he decided to start the company. Uh, um, one of our first uh, customers was Salesforce. Uh, we started to work with them in 2016. 
then we got our first paying customer uh, in 2017. Uh, we have a partnership with Google also in 2017. Um, and now in 2018, we've grown significantly. Um, we work with uh, Mar Labs, and uh, we're also doing some work in the, the IoT space with Hyundai, uh, testing a lot of their uh, software um, that goes into the uh, cars. So um, here's just sort of an overview of the different customers that we work with this over the past year. Uh, so it's a lot of different large enterprise customers. That's sort of our main focus. Um, so Salesforce, as I said before, Google, uh, TurboTax, a uh, number of customers that we work with um, right now. So why do companies uh, just want to work with Functionize? Well, um, by using artificial intelligence, we're able to reduce cost and time to market. Uh, so decrease uh, developer to uh, QA ratio. Uh, so a lot of times you'll have a ratio of one to one, one developer to one QA engineer. So we'd like to reduce that ratio to 10 to one. And by doing so, you know, we can save cu uh, customers, you know, thousands of dollars $500,000 a year, for example, in one, one uh, case study. Um, and also improve the, the time to deploy uh, from days to hours. Um, something else that we are very good at helping, helping companies do. Um, also, a lot of times, you know, software is very complex. Um, you know, we work with companies that have 30 plus million lines of code. So how do you test a system that that's, that's that large? And uh, I mean, really, you can't, it's very difficult to do by hand, right? So it's very difficult to write your test cases, uh, to test, uh, stuff, you know, software of that size. Um, you know, you wouldn't get good coverage. So the only way to do it, right, is to use artificial intelligence to aid um, and help uh, make your testing more efficient. So those are sort of some of the reasons why companies uh, uh, like to work with us. Uh, so there's sort of this trade-off between, um, development and then uh, testing and quality uh, control, right? So, you know, how do how do companies sort of, uh, you know, focus their efforts? Do they spend more time working on the, with developers and, you know, creating new features or do they focus more energy on uh, the quality user experience, right? So it's sort of a balancing act. Where do I, where do I put more resources, right? And so Functionize sort of tries to bridge that gap and allow you to do, actually do both. So you can both be innovative and also have high uh, user experience and quality. So um, right now, like I said before, um, we see a lot of companies have sort of the inefficient software development in which they have it just as many QA engineers as the developers. Um, and what we'd like to do is we'd like to make uh, that a more efficient process um, by reducing the ratio of developers to QA engineers. Um, now, that's not to say that we want to eliminate QA engineers. Um, QA engineers are very, very important. Um, and uh, the goal is not to um, eliminate them completely, but to actually aid them and make them more effective um, and improve uh, the, the work that they can do, right? So basically make their work more efficient, right? So um, I know there's, uh, you know, uh, other systems out there which are trying to, you know, automatically go through and test applications. Um, and that's, you know, it's very cool, but it's not as useful. I, what's really important um, when testing applications and making sure you understand the business logic. And uh, the only way to understand that uh, business logic is to actually uh, interact with the QA engineer. So it's so we really see ourselves as more of a, uh, a tool to aid the QA engineer and make them more effective. Right. So but the QA engineer is always still in control of our system. Right. So they're always uh, going to be controlling. Uh, uh, the system controlling the AI, right? So it's really putting the pop that power in their hands. Um, so sort of a little overview of what our platform looks like. So we collect data uh, from a different, multiple different sources. So the client or the user, um, also the modeler, the person that creates the test case. We also have some crowdsource input as well, which we use to train and label data. Uh, that data goes into our adaptive event analysis system. This is where all the AI and stuff um, is used and we build our models. And then once we've modeled the application, uh, we can then go and test that application in the cloud. Uh, we support all major browsers, Android, uh, iOS, uh, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, every major browser. Um, and then we run, we can run those tests in the cloud. And once they're done, we then provide the user um, with actionable results, which they can use to uh, improve their application. Um, so how do we improve software testing? So there's four main areas that we focus on. 
um, simplicity. So we want to make test creation as simple as possible. Um, so uh, we have a number of different ways that we can create tests um, in our platform. So we can create tests using both natural language. So a lot of times customer will have uh, user journeys sort of written down um, in naturally like in sentences form, right? So we can actually use that as input and create tests based on natural language. We built a NLP um, parser, which can parse through and actually build tests from, from sentence, sentence structured data. Um, we also allow the user to actually create tests manually using um, a model creation tool, which they can go through, um, click on their site and verify different uh, types of elements, uh, screenshots, that type of thing. Uh, and we also have an autonomous way as well to do some very basic um, uh, anomaly detection and stuff. And I'll talk, get a little bit more into that, that piece as we get to the end of the presentation. Uh, another point is uh, durability. Um, so, you know, once you create your test cases, how do we know that our test cases are going to continue to work over time, right? So as our application evolves, a lot of times those test cases are very brittle and they'll break. Um, so what we've done is we've built uh, these application meta models um, which really understand the core of what that application is doing. So even though if you move, you know, a button, you know, a couple pixels to the right or to the left, we're still able to click on that button and perform the test successfully. Um, we also use uh, visual template recognition. So we're actually able to identify um, on a site what is static content versus what is dynamic content automatically. Um, so a lot of times, for example, if let's say you're a news organization in which you have a new news story every day, Right, the content of that story will be changing, uh, but we're able to identify visually um, what part of that story is uh, dynamic in which you know it changes versus which is static. Right, the structure, like for example, the header will always be in the same location, that type of thing. Um, and then that also uses reinforcement learning uh, to do to do that process. Uh, the third point is efficiency. So um, it's really important. You know, time to market is really important uh, in in software development. Um, so how can we, you know, if we find bugs, how can we actually go and fix them uh, as fast as possible? So we built a root cause analysis system. So if you do actually have a test that fails, we're able to go back and through um, using our meta modeling, uh, actually go and find what was the root cause, why did that test case fail, uh, and provide you with uh, results that uh, you can then go and fix fix that test case or or fix any sort of bug in the system. Um, we also do uh, temporal anomaly detection and visual anomaly detection, right? So anomaly detection over time and anomaly detection visually, right? So if there's any sort of UI uh, breakage, we're able to identify those things as fast as possible. And then the fourth point is scalability. Uh, you want to be able to scale this and increase coverage of your site. Uh, so like I said before, we have a cloud-based infrastructure uh, on which you can run you know, tens of thousands of tests in parallel um, on your site. Uh, however you want, uh, the user can specify how many tests they'd like to run and on what platforms. Um, so this eliminates a lot of maintenance um, and also improves the coverage of, of your testing. So that's sort of a little overview of Functionize as a company. So this is sort of the, the key things that we focus on. Um, so now I'm gonna get a little bit more into um, what is machine learning. So I'm sure a lot of you, um, and I'm not entirely sure, um, you know, everyone on the call, if you've uh, done use machine learning before in your past or not, but I'm just going to give sort of a high level overview of what it is uh, for those that don't know uh, what machine learning is. Uh, so it's a very, you know, popular buzzword. A lot of people have heard of machine learning, but they do not know what is machine learning. So machine learning is a set of techniques used to achieve artificial intelligence. OK, so it's actually a subset of artificial intelligence. Uh, then what is artificial intelligence? Well, artificial intelligence is basically a way in which a computer can adapt to achieve a particular goal uh, given a set of data inputs, okay? So basically we're trying to build a system that can adapt, uh, make decisions uh, given the data uh, inputs that it can see. So that's, you know, like screenshot data, uh, time series data, all kinds of data inputs, right? So how can we use that data and make intelligent decisions. So that's what we would consider artificial intelligence, okay? And then uh, the key is that uh, these models are automatically created um, or learned from data without explicitly being programmed. So you can actually achieve intelligent intelligence uh, through direct programming, right? So you could actually program directly, you know, here's, here's you know, the, the, the logic of, of the software, right? So you could program that directly, but the difference in artificial intelligence is, is we're actually trying to use that input data to model and 
automatically uh, figure out what that logic is. So that's the difference. So that's sort of a, a high level overview of what, what machine learning is. Uh, so machine learning is sort of broken up into three main categories. Um, so there's supervised learning, there's unsupervised learning, and then there's reinforcement learning. Um, so what are the difference between those uh, three different uh, types of machine learning? So supervised learning means you're building models from labeled data. So what that means is you basically label it, um, your data by a particular category um, or tag, um, that type of thing. Um, so actually, so the user actually has to control uh, how the data is is uh, labeled, right? Uh, versus unsupervised learning, uh, you're actually building models from unlabeled data. So when we collect data, we may not know anything about its structure at all, uh, but we can still do things with it using unsupervised learning techniques. Okay, so it doesn't require any user intervention. You don't have to go and tag tag different pieces of data. Um, and then reinforcement learning is sort of a hybrid um, of the two, but what you do is you try and build a model that maximizes some reward, right? So this is, you're trying to achieve a goal, right? So you specify that I'd like to achieve a goal, um, and then we can build models to then maximize uh, that process and achieve that goal for you. So, so this is a very common technique um, that people use, for example, in playing games. Um, so how do you build an algorithm that can play chess, for example? Um, that's, that's one potentially application of uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, so um, then furthermore, uh, you can split these up a little bit, a uh, little bit further. So supervised learning, uh, what type of data uh, can we apply this to? Well, we can apply it to continuous data or discrete data. So continuous data is data, for example, like a time series, right, where you have a continuous timestamp that's uh, essentially labeling the data, right, um, by a timestamp, and that's a continuous data set. Um, and if you're doing supervised learning with continuous data, that would be called a regression. Um, and so it's, you know, it's very likely that a lot of you have done this before, or you may not have known it, but for example, like you could build a, you know, a scatter plot in uh, Excel and uh, find the best fit line that goes through that scatter plot. Well, that's a type of regression, linear regression. Um, so that's, that's, that's performing um, supervised learning on continuous data. The other type is doing supervised learning on discrete data. So this is data that is specifically tagged into subsets or classes, um, and that is called classification. Okay, so if you're doing supervised learning with a discrete set of data, uh, that's classification. Uh, and so next, uh, unsupervised learning, uh, the data structure, we don't know what it is, right? So we have no, no knowledge of what this data is. We don't know if it's continuous, we don't know if it's discrete, but we can still do things with it, right? So um, what we can do with it is we can do clustering or association. So what we do there is, so we try and cluster data into similar structures, right? Similar like sets, okay? So it doesn't matter if it's continuous or discrete, we're still able to um, actually perform some type of um, segmentation of that data. So that's called clustering. And then finally, um, we have reinforcement learning. Uh, you can do reinforcement learning on discrete data, again, and this is uh, a type of classification, or uh, if the data structure is unknown, uh, that we would call a control system. Uh, so a very popular example of this is using a Markov decision process, that type of thing. We're trying to actually control um, a, uh, an application or something, and you don't necessarily know if the data is continuous or discrete, right? It's sort of an unknown. Um, so th those are the main sort of areas of machine learning. Um, that people use today, okay? So can we apply machine learning to software testing? Uh, of course, yes, we can. That's you know obviously something that we do at Functionize a lot. Um, but what are the challenges? What are the challenges of using machine learning and software testing? Um, so these are sort of some examples of challenges uh, in building any type of machine learning model. Um, so there's the uh, challenge of accuracy, right? How accurate are these models gonna be, right? And so there's trade-offs between bias versus variance, and I'll describe that uh, a little bit more in the next slide, but basically you can have a model that's either underfit to the data or you can have a model that's overfit to the data, right? So that's the difference there. There's also this thing called the curse of dimensionality. Um, so strange things tend to happen uh, when you have high dimensional spaces, right? So if your data is very high dimensional, right, it tends to become very, very sparse and uh, finding trends and building models in high dimensions is very difficult. So one of the techniques that we use a lot is dimensional reduction. 
right? So we try and actually project high dimensional spaces into the lower dimensional spaces. Okay, so um, this is one challenge though in building machine learning models and then also uh, scalability and performance, right? So how well are these models gonna scale? Obviously there's a lot of math involved, right? And there's a lot of computation involved in, in building and training these models. Um, and you know, how well is that gonna perform and scale? But um, actually today, you know, with, um, you know, using cloud platforms and stuff, this actually has sort of been eliminated in that I can, you know, easily go and spin up thousands of instances and train a model relatively quickly. Uh, so this is not as much of a problem as it used to be, but it still can be an issue for some people, depending on the application. Um, so let's look a little bit more into this main um, issue of bias versus variance. Okay, so uh, model bias, what that means is you've introduced error from assumptions in the model, right? So the model is underfit. Uh, we've made some assumption about our data that may be incorrect, and we aren't able to fit um, a model to that data very well, so it's underfit. Um, versus the opposite is model variance, right? So this is error introduced from sensitivity to small fluctuations in the data, right? So the data is overfit. So for example, um, you may build this model, it might have high variance, or uh, and then when you try and you know model a new situation, it doesn't work because uh, that model is too constrained, right, to the uh, to the the training data, right? So that's that's an overfit situation. So this is sort of the trade-off. Um, in building uh, machine learning models. And so what you wanna do is you wanna hit sort of the sweet spot, right? So you want a complex model, but it can't be too complex, right? That you've overfit uh, the data, right? So you try and find something in the middle. And so this is sort of a, a good little diagram to uh, keep in mind is, is your error rate will go up if you have a low complexity model or a very high complexity model. So this is something that people don't always understand is, you know, well, why don't we just build a really complicated model? Well, the problem with that is you end up overfitting the data and you actually increase the error. So we're trying to find a, a nice balance in between. So that's sort of a, sort of an overview of machine learning. So now let's uh, get a little bit more into canary testing itself. So what is canary testing? And this is just one of the applications that we do at Functionize. Uh, it's something that we've partnered with Google to, to work with uh, actually the Google Spinnaker team uh, we're doing work with on this canary testing project. Um, so, um, you know, nowadays there's a lot of advanced deployment methods. Um, so some popular, uh, you know, companies sort of uh, pioneered this is Facebook and Netflix, um, in which you have multiple versions of your software running at the same time, right? So when you do a new release, you're not necessarily releasing uh, that software to everybody. You're actually maybe releasing it to a small number of people. Right, so this is a more advanced deployment method that a lot of companies are moving towards is actually running multiple versions of the software at the same time with split traffic. Okay, um, so in canary testing, basically that's what we want to do, right? So we want to identify, you know, is our the new version of our application, uh, does it have any, you know, issues, any bugs, any anomalies, that type of thing versus the old version of the software. So what we can do is we can split the traffic. So we're basically having the users do the QA for us, right, automatically. So the users become the QA. Um, so this is an example. So maybe you have 95% of your users when they visit the site, they see the current version of the application, and 5%, a small subset, will see the new version of the application, okay? Um, so that's, that's, that's the kind of deployment model that we're looking at when we talk about canary testing. And so how this, differs from like A-B testing. In A-B testing, you're trying to identify, um, you know, the effectiveness of new features, uh, whereas in canary testing, you're trying to identify anomalies uh, between two versions. So the, the approach is slightly different, but it is similar in that you are, um, you know, obviously using two different versions of the site at the same time, okay? Um, so how does our uh, canary model sort of look? Um, so this is an overview of, uh, sort of the process. So users arrive at this, your site. There's uh, typically a load balancer in front, right? So that load balancer can decide uh, what version of the code to go to. So about 95% will view the current code, the current version of the software, and then maybe 5% of that user base will then go and visit the new version of the software, okay? 
So then what we do is we collect the data from both, both of these, right? right? So we record the data, record the different actions um, that users perform, the different elements that they click on, the different things that they move their mouse over. So we record all this data um, that these users are performing on the site. We use that to build um, our models, okay, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and then once we've built those models, we can then compare the model of user behavior of the current version of the site versus the new version, right? So we're comparing the models themselves, not the data. Right? So that's very important to, to understand. Um, and then once we've done that, we can identify any anomalies. And if there are anomalies, um, we can reject the new code, right? So the canary test has failed. Um, and so basically what that means is the new code had some sort of issue that, um, you know, we didn't see in the current version. And so we re reject that. Or if, if they seem to line up uh, fine, then we would release that new code um, to 100% of the user base. Okay, so this allows you to, to basically catch errors very, very quickly um, before they propagate to your entire user base. So if there is a, an error or a bug in the system, only a small percentage of people will actually ever see it, um, which is important. Okay, um, so one of the techniques that we use for this is called clustering. Um, so this is an unsupervised learning technique. Um, so what we do is we take that user behavior and we cluster it into similar um, types of user journeys. Uh, so what this allows us to do is actually identify automatically the different user journeys on your site. Um, so by recording the different interactions that users have performed, um, we're able to find clusters in that data. And uh, then we use what's called um, a kike information criteria. Um, this is basically a technique to sort of judge to see how well do these clusters actually fit the model, right? So it measures um, relative information loss um, by forming different clusters. So what you can do is you can um, build an algorithm and we use k-means clustering and expectation maximization. Those are the, uh, the type of techniques that we use here. Um, and then we can basically say, okay, well, let's look at the data if it was in two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, five clusters, et cetera. Um, until we reach sort of a minimum in which um, the information loss by adding more clusters is uh, is not it's not too high, right? So we reach a sort of a minimum point. So this uh, chart on your right here, you can see um, in the data that we actually uh, ran a test on, we found that there were five clusters in our data, so five sort of similar user journey structures um, that were identified. Um, so this is sort of an example of that. Um, so this is uh, sort of a graph that we made of the site. We actually instrumented our own site, Functionize.com. Um, and this is a graph showing all the different interactions that have performed. So a node here is an, um, a, a page or an interaction that has been done. And then the, the edges show uh, the path or what links those sequences together. Um, so up here in the corner, we highlighted here's a cluster that we found. This is a very common cluster. So what, what is happening here? Well, um, the user is logging in. Uh, then the next thing that they do is they forgot password. And then after that, they reset their password and then they log in again. So that's a very common um, uh, cluster of data that we found, right? So that really shows that we're able to identify that as a user journey, right? So you'd wanna make sure that that linkage is always complete, right? So let's say that if we ran uh, this test on a new site, or a new version of the code, and we found that looking at this cluster, we found that the user logged in, forgot password, reset password, but never logged in again, then we might assume that, uh, you know, maybe that reset password didn't work, right? So we're able to identify that automatically using clustering. So uh, that's one of the techniques. And then the next technique we use is um, called long short-term memory. Uh, so this is a type of uh, recurrent neural network Okay, um, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to actually measure um, sort of correlations in a sequence of data. So like I said, so these user journeys form sequences in time. And we're trying to model those sequences um, using this LSTM model. Okay, and these are sort of some of the equations that uh, we, we use in that model. Uh, so F, so the difference between this and a typical neural network is there's actually a for bit gate. So some of the data you intentionally forget over time. Um, so F, F of T, that's the equation uh, for the forget gate. Uh, w and uh, C basically model, those are the those are matrices which model the weights of the uh, input and the uh, reoccurrent steps in the, the system. So basically what we do is we chain a lot of these uh, neurons together 
Um, I, I is the input data and O is the output data. Um, and so what we do is we uh, basically build these LSTM models, which are sequences of neurons to try and learn and understand, well, what is the sequence uh, that we expect in uh, this user journey, okay? And uh, so our hybrid approach is then let's combine the two, right? So let's combine um, expectation maximization or clustering uh, with this LSTM model together, right? And use both of them, right? So both understand the clusters, but then also understand within the clusters, that's those sequences of steps, okay? So how we build, uh, how we identify anomalies then is uh, we use the user journeys found by the expectation maximization algorithm, the clustering. Um, next, we build LSTM models to predict uh, the next action that a user uh, would perform in that user journey, right? So we can use LSTM models to do that. Um, so then if uh, the next click or the next action is too far off from what the LSTM model predicts, uh, that would be identified as an anomaly, okay? Um, and then if there's too many anomalies in the system, uh, that would uh, uh, basically trigger uh, a failure, right? So that canary test would then fail. Uh, and so we picked a threshold of about 80%. Um, and for different applications, that will obviously vary. So it really depends on um, how much uh, is changed in the application. So um, this is really useful uh, in applications in which you have incremental releases. Um, so for example, if, if you were to release a new version of the site that's completely different from the old version, this approach obviously would not for, work very well. You'd have to lower that threshold, right? Because a lot of those uh, new data points would be new features and not actually uh, anomalous behavior, right? Uh, versus, um, but a lot of customers end up doing incremental releases in which the difference between version one and version two is maybe, you know, five or 10%, um, you know, of that is actually new features, but most of it, you know, 90 plus percent is old features. Um, and in that sort of situation, this works very, very well um, for identifying anomalies in behavior. Um, so uh, let's, so we actually ran this test on our own site. Um, so we trained data from uh, uh, user data collected from functionize.com. We collected about 10,000 user sessions. Um, we used 80% of that to train the model and then 20% to test and validate the model. Um, and the really cool thing was, is we were able to predict using both the clustering and the LSTM models together, um, we were able to predict the next user action with about 85% accuracy. Um, so if you think about that, that's actually pretty amazing because you could go to the site and based on the last action that you've done with 85% accuracy, we could predict the next thing you would click on, okay? And uh, on, you know, an application that has, you know, many, you know, hundreds of buttons, uh, that, that's a very powerful, very, very powerful tool to be able to do that, right? So 85% of the time, we're able to predict the next thing that you'll click on given the previous step that you clicked on, right? Or the previous action that you performed. Okay, so, um, so sort of in conclusion, sort of wrapping this up, um, so we're successfully able to identify five clusters in user behavior. Uh, some of those uh, were like user login, uh, reset password. Others were like, uh, you know, sessions that involve reading our blog uh, um, or other types of things like that. Um, we identified about 2% of the sessions were identified as outliers um, in that data, okay? Uh, and then from that, we were able to easily identify anomalies in user sessions. Uh, in this case, there, there weren't any anomalies because the two versions of the site uh, were worked well. There weren't any major bugs. Um, but then, so the overall, the LSTM model can accurately predict the probabilities of uh, the next action in a user session. Um, and then this analysis we can then use to gate releases uh, and perform this canary testing, okay? So that's sort of, a, sort of an overview of the canary testing and advanced anomaly detection that we do at Functionize. Um, so that's sort of the end. Uh, and here's my email. If you'd like to email me, uh, feel free. Uh, but uh, now I'll open up for any questions or comments. Hey, John. This is Smitha again. Uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant presentation on uh, AI. And I, I actually learned a lot today. So thank you. Great. Great. Yes. Um, so we do have a few questions. So we'll take them up now. OK. So the first one is. Uh, how does canary, canary testing handle traffic volume anomalies? Traffic volume anomalies? Mm -hmm. So um, that's a good question. Um, so 
if there are, uh, for example, higher uh, levels of traffic, um, that's not going to uh, hurt the model at all. And the reason is, is because we do the clustering first. Okay, so the clustering itself um, does not matter on the number of uh, uh, users that visit the site. So for example, um, like I said before, if when you split traffic 95%, uh, you know, on the old site or on the old site and 5% on the new site, obviously the traffic volumes will be different, right? Um, we're, we're basically at the beginning, we're, we're sort of splitting the data uh, to say that, you know, 20 times more volume is going to be on the old site versus the new site. Um, so so it, the, the, the objective is not really to identify are there anomalies in traffic itself, but to actually sort of normalize that, right? So, uh, so we're actually artificially splitting the traffic into different volumes but because we do clustering first uh, that takes care of that so that's looking at you know the different sequences as opposed to the volume of those sequences right so um, we're not finding we're not looking for uh, anomalies in traffic volume so that would be more of an a b testing type of thing right so a b testing would look at uh, sort of you know if I have a new feature um, you know are there uh, you know, more more users that click on that button or not, right? That so that's more of an A/B testing. So that's not what we're doing, right? We're doing we're trying to find anomalies in user journeys. Um, so it's a it's a different approach. So um, so the answer to that question is is we're not really trying to find anomalies in in user traffic or volume. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is, can you use Google Analytics or weblogs to train for expectation or maximization? So um, you can. The uh, difference is, is the data set that you get from Google Analytics is not going to be as rich as the data set that we can collect. Uh, the reason is, is because they're not actually um, recording uh, the different types of interactions that are performed, right? So they're recording the different URLs that you visit. Right, so you can put, you know, obviously a Google Analytics uh, JavaScript in your page, and they'll record the different sequences of URLs. But there's a lot more than that. So, for example, um, one of the major things that um, we found, or what we test, is, uh, for example, users filling out forms. Um, so, if you have a form that has, you know, maybe I don't know, five, six, seven inputs, right? So, fill out your name, fill out your email, fill out your phone number, that type of thing. Um, that's not something that use, uh, Google Analytics is necessarily going to track, right? So they're going to track that you're on that page, yes, but they're not going to track how you filled out that form and if that form actually worked, right? So that's the difference is we're actually collecting a much richer data set than Google Analytics. Now, yes, you could use Google Analytics um, to uh, as, as input data into the system, right, to sort of find uh, correlations in the different sequences of URLs, but uh, we find that it's really more useful to collect that full data set, understand every interaction that the user does, not just the URL that they visited. Okay, so that's so that's how I would answer that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we'll move on to the next question, which is, can you actually uh, identify? Hold on, can you find multiple dimensions? To for the data that is regular users versus power users versus admin users or you know if there are various mm. kinds yeah yeah so definitely definitely so um when you perform the clustering that's exactly what you're going to find right so you'll find that uh, power users will use you know maybe much more uh much much more features on their site versus just a casual user that's just visiting for the first time, right? So when you cluster that data, you're actually going to split those into two different clusters. So one cluster of data will be data from the power user, and the other cluster will be data uh, from, you know, maybe a casual first-time user of the site. Um, so that's sort of automatically taken care of, right? And that's why we use both approaches, using the clustering and the neural network at the end. So yes, of yeah. course. Thank you. Actually, I also had this question personally myself that yeah, if there yeah. are yeah. like five different types of users, then there will be definitely five different types of user journeys. So absolutely, absolutely, yes, definitely. Okay. Um, all right. So the next one is uh, how can you apply this to database testing, like source to target validation with several transformations? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so I would say, I mean, this. It's not something that we've necessarily tried. This is mostly something that uh, we use to test the, the front end part of the site. 
Um, now, of course, you know, if there's a number of APIs that connect to the, you know, your backend database, um, you would sort of, you would test that to some extent, but it's not really fully focused on testing databases at all. That's not really the, the, the purpose here. Um, now, yes, you could probably, um, if you were to install this on the back end of the site, right, just install this type of system on the back end of the site, which you're recording all these different database transactions, yes, you could perform the same type of techniques using that data set. But the data set that we're collecting here is um, from JavaScript recorded actions, right? So it's not necessarily testing that database. But if you were to send us data from the database itself, right, actually install something on the other end, then yes, you could use the same math. It's the same math, um, so you could do it. But that's not something that that we've done uh, in this example. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So there's another question that says: Is there any chance uh, to use this approach for the case of product with few users, or let's say no users yet, because uh, and let's say there is no volume of data, no traffic, uh, because it is we are doing it just for QA, or it's a very initial release. Yeah, yeah. So um, I would say, uh, so this is probably not the right approach for that. This is requiring, so the purpose of doing the canary testing is really requiring um, you to have some traffic on your site because that's the data that we use to analyze. Now, that's not to say that you can't test test uh, sites that do not have any users yet. Uh, so at Functionize, we provide other tools to solve that problem, um, but it's not something that we do with this canary testing approach. So if you want to test um, a site uh, that you know has no users at all, uh, you can use other tools that we provide. For example, like natural language processing, uh, test generation, right? So actually writing down, you know, here's what we expect our user journeys to be. Even though we've never seen any traffic yet, you can just write down a paragraph, and then we'll analyze that language and produce tests for you. Um, so we can do that, um, but that's not something that uh, we do with canary testing. So I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that unless you actually have traffic on your site yet. Yeah, okay. I I was about to say that that in any algorithm for that matter, for it to be smart enough to give you any output, it has to be trained at least on right. some. Yeah, that's site. right. Unless that's it's right. got multiple passes, it won't be able to tell you right or wrong. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. Here is a question specifically for your company. Um, how does Functionize reduce test maintenance? Yeah. So. Um, we reduce test maintenance, and let me go back to that slide. Um, so we eliminate maintenance um, by increasing the durability of the tests, right? So when you build a test on our system, it will not fail as often because uh, we have more, more intelligence around that test about the application itself. So we've built these meta models about the application. So when you build that test, Right, you should only be building it once, and then the system will take care of it. Right, so as your system, as your application will evolve, maybe you know buttons may move around because um, we use a lot of different data, right, both visual data and time series data. Um, those tests are not going to break as frequently, so that really reduces the uh, the maintenance of the tests. Okay, so that's okay. so that's, that's basically what what we do to improve maintenance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, in effect, uh, the regression is actually continuously happening by itself. Correct. Correct. That's right. Exactly. So, we're always constantly remodeling and updating those models automatically. Mm -hmm. right. so, yeah. so, you should only create that test once and it should run basically forever, right? Until, until it's of, a new change or something, right? Yes. And it kind of fixes itself as and when you're changing this stuff. Correct. Okay. That's right. Uh, so, the next question is, uh, could you give uh, more details on using NLP for automatic test generation? Mm -hmm. uh, is... Okay. Um, so, well, I don't know exactly how much <laughs> more detail. I mean, this could be an entire talk in and of itself. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, what we could do, John, if this is something yeah. you would like to respond to, but in detail, you could probably send a, a, a written response to it, Absolutely. and we could publish Absolutely. it on the site. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I could, uh, or maybe I could write a, a blog article or something. But, but uh, yeah, basically for the natural language test creation, uh, what we've done is we've provided uh, basically an interface in which you can write down your user journey in natural language. So, for example, maybe your test is, you know, click on 
uh, you know, the username, you know, enter the username, click on the password, enter your password, and then click login. So that would be a basic sort of user journey, like test the login, right? So you could you could specify each action, or you could say, you know, test the login functionality of the site. Now, because we've built a lot of models that, uh, you know, that have done a lot of these user, that have done tests around these user journeys, something like that uh, is something we would be able to recognize. So we can actually parse that language and understand what was your intent behind that uh, that test that you just specified, right? You, you basically typed out, and then actually build um, a functioning test on the back end, which can run um, in the cloud, right? So we're basically trying to convert that language into a actual test case of all the different steps. So you may not have to specify every single step along the way, right? You can be a little bit vague. I mean, not too vague, but um, because, you know, obviously then we wouldn't be able to understand it. But if you're, you know, if it's something that's a very common uh, type of user journey, it's something that we would be able to easily identify um, using that natural language. But I can get more into that later. I mean, that's um, there's a lot of other models, and I didn't even talk about those in this talk at all. There's other um, machine learning techniques that we use for that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'll actually send you this question. I mean, uh, sure. somebody from the team will, so you could actually give a more detailed response yeah. to this. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I'm going to take one last question here. Uh, so do you use uh, the journey info along with heat map info and uh, response times to provide more efficient journeys? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, we definitely use uh, response times and performance testing. So we do a lot of performance testing, actually. Um, that's another thing that we provide um, from the company. Um, so that is something that we look at. So it's another attribute. When we do canary testing, it's another attribute in that data set. So when we collect the data, every piece of data has a timestamp on it. And we do look at the difference in those timestamps to say, well, this page, you know, normally takes one second to load and now it's taking five seconds to load, right? So why is that? So that could be an anomaly itself. Um, so we do actually look at that. That's another piece of data that we use. Um, uh, in terms of like heat map stuff, uh, it's not, we don't use that um, as much. We do record obviously all the different mouse movements and whatnot. Um, but what we find is that tends to be fairly noisy, okay? And unless you have a very, very large user base, um, you're not gonna find a lot of strong correlations in that. But uh, again, it is something that is recorded and it's another attribute in that model, okay? So, so yeah, so we, we, do, we do actually collect that type of information and, and use mm -hmm. it. A couple of small queries from the presentation uh, itself, uh, John. So at, on the bias versus variance screen, you mentioned that uh, both low and high complexity causes errors. Correct. Mm -hmm. So why would low complexity cause errors? So low complexity would cause errors because um, basically your model is not uh, sophisticated enough to fit the data. So a very, very basic example is, let's say you have um, uh, a data set that has non-linear behavior, okay? So uh, the response from that data maybe is it's not linear, right? So maybe it's like quadratic or cubic or some other type of fit, right? Uh, and then if you try and apply a linear model, a model that's trying to fit that data to a straight line, it's obviously not going to work, right? Because that mm -hmm. model is not complex enough. It doesn't have enough dimensionality to understand that the response is not a linear response. Okay, so that would be an example of a low complexity model trying to fit a high complexity, you know, high complex dimension or higher dimensional space. Um, and it just, it wouldn't work, right? So that would be an example of underfitting of the data. Okay, understood. Right. That, does that make uh -huh. sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like uh, you're trying to oversimplify it and keep it right. very simple as a model, whereas the actual problem you're trying to solve is multidimensional and more yeah. complicated. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah, okay. Uh, and quick question on your split traffic stuff. Uh, since you are comparing model and not mm -hmm. uh, data, and yep. you also mentioned that you are uh, it's uh, doing uh, a testing which is a little different than ab testing because ab testing is more like you know you're testing the landing pages you're testing the clicks on the buttons the colors of uh, the stuff here you are actually getting into the functionalities and into the actual model to That's see right. if that model is working right That's right so the question is, uh, and you are actually exposing 5% of your real time users to it mm -hmm. so do you see a risk in doing this? 
a risk and, in here? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, exposing your real-time users who are actually using the application mm -hmm. to uh, a model which may not really be, uh, you know, it, it may not be 100% right or it may not be as intended mm -hmm. and it may be a disaster, hypothetically, yeah. let's say. Sure, sure, and sure. yeah, so one yep. question is, do you see a risk in doing that? And under is, mm -hmm. Can we actually address this with us? Uh, and, and this could be a very simplified version, but can we actually uh, address it with AB tech kind of thing with a very specific user profile saying, you know, this region, this age group, this kind of user, this user, something like that, and try to do that kind of testing? Would yeah, be sure, sure. Well, you, you could, so, right. So you could add more intelligence into the load balancer itself and how you split the traffic. Um, mm -hmm. So what we've done here is we've sort of, because we're trying to build a model of the entire application, but if you're only interested in building a model on a specific functionality or subset of the application, of course, you could add more intelligence to how you split the data. The risk is, is that you could basically introduce bias into that sampling, right? So um, in order to reduce bias in the modeling itself, uh, you want to make sure that your sampling is also unbiased, right? So if you introduce a bias to say, we're only going to split traffic based on a certain demographic um, mm -hmm. or maybe location, uh, that can affect the modeling itself and pr maybe produce a less accurate model. Um, mm -hmm. So that's sort of the risk in, in that approach. So that's why we we do this sort of, it's, uh, it's more of a random sampling of the entire user base um, versus trying to you know, key in on a specific demographic or location. But of course you could, I mean, if that was all that you really cared about was that, um, you know, small subset of functionality, I guess you could do that, but you'd also have to split or the traffic for the current version as well, right? You couldn't compare um, one demographic on the new version and then all mm -hmm. demographics on the old version, right? Because that wouldn't, that wouldn't be a comparable model, right? And so if you'd you, actually you, have, yeah, yeah, you have to have yeah. all kinds Correct. of uh, user profiles and then pick Correct. each kinds of those profiles. Correct. You'd have to do it on both sides. You'd have to mm -hmm. filter that data on the current version and the new version as well. You could just do one or the other, right? Because that data set should be yeah. comparable. Right? Makes sense. Yep. And uh, yep. have you ever seen users drop out because of this process? Like, the fun are, are, are these functionalities and models so uh, tiny and small in uh, the bigger picture of the application that really, even if it is a complete failure, the user doesn't drop out. Yeah, so um, uh, I have not seen that yet. Of course, uh, we've only really instrumented this on our own site. Um, so I've not seen that situation happen. Um, however, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 basically the footprint of, of this is a small JavaScript code that runs on the front end, right? So you embed a small JavaScript that records the different interactions and it sends it back to uh, the back end, but it batches that process. So it's not sending, it's not like sending, you know, hundreds of requests a second or something on every different mouse movement, right? So we actually batch it. And we're only gonna send a request maybe once every couple seconds on the recorded data. Uh, so it doesn't really introduce much overhead at all um, to the user. So the user is never gonna really notice um, that, you know, what's happening. Um, so I would say that's not that's not really a problem that, that I've, I've encountered in which Very in which nice. they sort of bounce um, because the site isn't performing right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, yeah. that helps a lot. So uh, thank you, John. I'm going to first up. Uh, yeah, I'm also going to take away the screen share from you. All right, so thank you again, John. It was a very insightful session and uh, on the role and use of machine learning and AI in the new age testing. So I'm sure our attendees found it very informative and useful too. Uh, thanks again, and I hope to see you in San Francisco. Do join us for the conference. Absolutely, absolutely. Great, thank you so much. Well, everyone, this uh, concludes our webinar for today. And uh, thank you for joining and most importantly, uh, more importantly, thank you for being so engaging and making the most of the webinar for yourself and for the whole group. Uh, if you want to see more such sessions from speakers like John and others and wish to learn more about machine learning and AI related subjects, please do come over to STPCon Spring 2019. And stay tuned for more webinars and online trainings coming soon at STP, sorry, at softwaretestpro.com. And if you haven't yet signed up for the upcoming webinar, which is how measuring defect detection percentage 
improves test coverage by MET on 12th December, then please do. Uh, as mentioned again, uh, Matt is a solution architect for desktop and the link for registration is up for you to so go ahead. Thank you everyone and have a great week ahead. See you all in San Francisco in April 2019. Happy learning.